Good morning and welcome to the house of the Lord. It is a good and joyful thing when we can gather together and have a sense of humor about things. And you got to see some of you, because we were still talking about a few things, you got to see what happens um, normally 10 or 15 minutes before the service starts. But um, it is a good thing when we get to do these uh, have these special services because it is indeed the third Sunday of Advent and we are having a special Chrismon and Kresh service and these this service is full of yes information but also scripture and singing and many ways to remind us of the reason for the season and so we, as we continue to prepare our hearts for worship, we also remember and look to the things, the other events that we have during this season. Some of our normal things, some special. And so we do have our uh, 50 and over Christmas party at Elsa and Pat's. The um, address is there, that's today at five. Um, if you have not spoken to Elsa about that, you might want to do that, you know, right after church. And um, also we have our fellowship dinner. It's our special Christmas fellowship dinner. And there's going to be, um, this. that's Wednesday at 6 p.m. It's turkey, sweet potato casserole, broccoli casserole and rolls. And you are invited to bring a holiday dessert to share um, or regular dessert to share. Just bring a dessert, We yes. Um, but also please remember to RSVP. You can call and leave a message. You don't have to wait for the church office to be open. You can go ahead and call soon-ish, in an hour or so. And um, you can also email the church office, and those, both of those, the number and the, the telephone number and the email are right there. But if you will go ahead and do that if you're planning to come, because we actually order that food in, and we need the numbers by Monday. So thank you for that. Also, a reminder that this Monday, we do have a church council meeting at 5.30 in the library, in the church library. And so we, next week is the annual March to the Manger. So at the end of the service, we will have the Manger set up and we will be sharing our special gifts and um, offerings. And that is a little bit of extra information is right there if you're wondering what it's all about because I had to ask the same question. What is this March to the Manger thing? And so there's extra information there to let you understand why we do what we do on that special day, that last Sunday of Advent. And otherwise, there's a lot going on. Please take a moment to look in your bulletin to see what all is happening. You're invited to be part of our prayer Zoom. If you would like to do that, please let us know because we do have to send you the link. You can call in or Zoom in to that. And so there's two ways to do that. And otherwise, let us continue to prepare our hearts for worship as we bring the light of Christ into worship.
Will you pray with me, please? Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that you chose Mary to be the woman who would bear your child in this world for us, in a time when I'm sure she was filled with uncertainty, when she was filled with questions of what her son would grow to be. Lord, who could know? And yet you knew. And Lord, we are grateful for the joy with which she received that news from the angel, telling her, you have been chosen to bear the Son of God. Heavenly Father, on this Sunday, devoted to the idea of joy, may you continue to put in our hearts that same sense of wonder, that same sense of anticipation, of expectation. Lord, give us that sense of joy that Mary must have felt when she had been told who she was and why she had been selected. Lord, give us that opportunity to share that joy of your son in this Advent season with the world around us. In your most holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Now if you would please stand for our call to worship this morning, which I will lead, and Pastor Missy will be leading the response. Let our souls give glory to our God, our hearts sing out their praise. From age to age, to all who fear, such mercy love imparts. Praise God, whose loving covenant supports those in distress. Remembering past promises with present faithfulness.
This is the this is the third Sunday in Advent. Today we light two purple candles and the pink candle. The first Sunday we lit the candle of hope. On the second Sunday, we lit the candle of peace. Today, we light the candle of joy. One thing that sometimes happens as we get ready to celebrate Jesus' birth is we expect to be happy all the time. Joy is not the same as happy. Joy is a deeper feeling created by knowing that God cares for us. Joy is remembering that God sent Jesus so we would not be alone and always know of God's care. During Advent, we pray that we may remember again God's gift of Jesus to the world and know the joy that gift brings to all people. We light this candle as a symbol of Christ our joy. When we look at the third candle, we remember God's promise of joy. God promised to send a savior to the people. Hear the word of God from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 35, verse 10, on the third Sunday of Advent. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for your son, Jesus. May the joyful promise of your presence, O oh God, make us rejoice in our hope of salvation. Help us live in such a way that our words and our actions help others know the joy you give. Amen. time to include the setting around Jesus' birth. Devout Christians have been drawn for centuries to the manger crib where Christ was born. There are records of believers celebrating his birth in the city of Bethlehem as early as the third century. Boards from the creche, said to be from the stable where Jesus was born, appeared in Rome's Basilica of Santa Maria Maggiore. Is that good? In the fourth century, early nativity scenes were found on sarcophagi, usually coffins, and wall paintings in the catacombs of Rome. Such scenes were also used on seventh century decorative artifacts carved in glass and ivory. Medieval plays and dev various devotions commemorating the birth of Jesus of Christ also added to the creche tradition. But it was in 1223 that the creche really began to grow in popularity when St. Francis of Assisi dramatized the event by staging a nativity scene with live animals out in the woods near Riete, Italy, and the creche became a serious way to remind believers of the mystery and majesty of Christ's birth. Over time, the understanding and appreciation of this special scene 
developed into the popular nativity representations of today. As the gospel spread throughout the world, each culture began to interpret the birth of the Savior in its own way. Yet no matter how an artist or culture expresses the wonder of God's greatest gift to humanity, the figure of the Christ child is always at the center of a scene, reminding us of the presence of God in our midst and as the center of every Christian's life. Please stand as we join in singing the first verse of O Little Town of Bethlehem. join together in the congregational prayer. God of every nation and people, from the very beginning of creation, you have made manifest your love. When our need for a Savior was great, you sent your Son to be born of the Virgin Mary. To our lives he brings joy and peace, justice, mercy, and love. Lord, bless all who look upon this nativity. May it remind us of the humble birth of Jesus and raise up our thoughts to him, who is God with us and Savior of all, and who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Chrismons, as we see over here on this tree, just as the birth of Jesus is shown to us in the creche, the story of Jesus is also often told using symbols and signs. A chrisman is a religious symbol used to remind us of our rich history as Christians. Today, we are going to learn the symbols that we place on our chrismon tree. For many of us, the meaning for our Christian symbols has been lost. Cairo. The word chrismon is made up of two words, Christ and monogram. The very earliest chrismons were made up of letters that were initials for names of Jesus. Our first chrismon today is made of the Greek letters chi ro the first two letters in the Greek spelling of Christ. Fish. Hebrews 1, 1 through 2, in many and various ways, God spoke of old to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by a son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. The fish was a secret sign used by the early Christian church to show someone you were a Christian. We freely gather to celebrate the birth of Christ, but early Christians were not so lucky. They needed a way to identify themselves as Christians without the risk of being arrested are killed because of their faith. When talking with someone, they would draw a fish in the sand with their toe. If the person they were speaking to did not react, they would simply wipe it out and continue with their, self, their conversation. 
They used the sign of the fish because the Greek letters for fish, ichthus, represent the first letter of the words, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, Savior. This symbol may be the oldest sign we have for us as Christians. Please stand as we sing, It Came Upon a Midnight Clear. came from the east to Jerusalem asking, where is the child that's been born king of the Jews? For we have observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. Stars come in many forms and shapes. The four pointed natal star reminds us of Jesus' birth and the four gospels that tell of his life and ministry. The five pointed star is the epiphany star also popularly called the Bethlehem star. Shaped roughly like a human being, it represents Jesus' incarnation. The six-pointed star is most often called the Star of David and reminds us that Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah, sometimes called the Son of David. Another name for this star is the Creator star, as its six points remind us of the six days of creation that was then made complete by a seventh day of rest. The eight-pointed baptismal star has in it the Greek cross as well as the Greek letter chi, the first letter of the word Christ in Greek. Like the fish, it was used as a secret symbol to help Christians recognize each other during times of persecution. Since the number eight is symbolic of rebirth or regeneration, it became associated with baptism. Please stand as you are able and join in the first verse of We Three Kings of Orient Are. God, on this day when with joy and wonder and thanksgiving, we thank you for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the opportunities that we have to share our resources, our gifts with others. And so we ask that you bless 
the gifts of tithes and offerings and all the different ways that we have been trying to be your light in the world. The socks, the underwear, the canned goods, the zippers, the thumb drives, the monies, all of these ways in which we are trying to love others as you have called us to. And so, dear God, bless all of these gifts in their many, many forms. Bless those who receive them in all the different forms they take and who help these gifts get where they need to go along the way. And bless us who give them so that in that blessing we may continue to be the light that your son has said we are in the world. And so, dear God, we thank you for these gifts and we ask for your blessing upon them. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Please stand as you are able for the doxology. Luke 1, 26 through 28. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man named Joseph of the house of David. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. Angels symbolize the nativity of Jesus. The word angel means messenger, and angels most often appear in the context of a message from God. Examples are the Annunciation to Mary, the appearance to shepherds at Christmas, and the announcement of the resurrection. Angels also represent the watchfulness or presence of God. reminds us of baby Jesus, the very first visitor. In Jesus' time, shepherds were outsiders and not welcome in a home of nice people. Yet, it was these outsiders the angel sent to be the first to greet the Christ child. This was a sign of God's love for all people, even those who others ignored and despised. Jesus' life and ministry reinforced this reality that God's love and salvation was for all the world, not simply the rich, powerful, and self-righteous. Shepherd's staff also reminds us Jesus is our good shepherd, caring for us, seeking us when we get lost. We most often see the shepherd's staff in the candy canes we hand out, use as decorations, and eat this time of year.
reading from Malachi 4, 2. But for you who revere my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in its wings, and you will go out and leap like calves released from the stall. The Son is often used as a prophetic symbol for Christ. That's the Son of Righteousness, and now we're talking about the crown. Matthew 2, 1-2. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. The crown is a symbol of royal authority and is often used for Christ, the King of Kings. It may also be used as a crown of life, the eternal reward of the faithful. Three crowns may be used to represent the wise men from the east who came in search of the baby Jesus. And now if you'll please stand as you are able and join in the first verse of Hark the Herald Angels Sing. <laughs>
cornerstone. Ephesians 2.19 tells us, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. The cornerstone, as a symbol for Christ, has Old Testament roots in the Psalms and the prophets. Jesus referred to himself indirectly as the cornerstone, and Paul carried the idea of Christ as the basis for our lives into the first century and beyond. The crown of thorns. In Mark 15, chapter, verses 16 through 20, we read that the soldiers led Jesus away into the palace, that is, the praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him, then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews! Again and again they struck him on the head with a staff and spit on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. The crown of thorns reminds us of Christ's great love for us and all he was willing to suffer to save us. We're going to invite you to stay seated for our first praise anthem this morning. It's more of a kind of meditative song to begin with in How Many Kings. And I think that my favorite line in the song is how many greats have become the least for me. I'm not a math person, that's why I teach language arts, but I can understand the concept of the idea that there is nothing greater than God and nothing smaller than us compared to him. And yet, he was willing to humble himself for us, to give up all his majesty for us. So, if you wish to sing with us, the words will be on the screen, or if you just want to listen and think about what the words mean to you, we invite you to enjoy How Many Kings.
And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Did anybody else get a little tight in the throat? Well, that song. Whew. So, if you remember last week, we heard about Zechariah and Elizabeth and the birth of little John the Baptist. <laughs> and we had the middle part that we did not read. And in that middle part is where the angel comes and says to Mary, Hail to you, favored one. And she finds out that she is going to have God's son. And we don't know in Luke, but in Matthew we hear that Joseph has heard about Mary being pregnant and is going to divorce her quietly because when you were engaged back then, it was a legal binding thing and you had to get divorced. And, and an angel appeared to him in a dream and said, no, stay married to Mary, to stay with Mary and then marry her when the time comes. And we don't know exactly when this reading would happen in that. Did Mary know about what Joseph was going through? But we know that Mary, after the angel spoke to her, went to visit her kinswoman, sometimes cousin Elizabeth. And so this is what happens when they meet. And this is Luke 1, 39 through 55. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. And Mary said, my soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, and he has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever just as he promised our ancestors. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So, in the midst of being told that she is going to have a child who is going to be God's son, and not knowing what is going on with her betrothed, she, Mary, takes off and goes to be with family, a cousin, a kinswoman in the hill country. And we hear these beautiful words of a joy that Elizabeth shares and praise that Mary shares. And even in this joyful time, there is underneath it the things that are all a part of our lives. That there are 
as then inequities and people misusing power. There were that here and now we have inequities and people misusing power. It is then that there were um, people who were proud in their inmost thoughts and maybe proud in their outer thoughts too. Um, we have people who lord things over other people and sometimes want to just put other people down to feel better about themselves. And Mary says, yes, these things happen, but God is dealing with it. And in this time and place, God is doing something and dealing with it. And in this time and place, God is doing something and dealing with it. As in Christ, who, as we say in our communion liturgy, ate with sinners. I don't know, we get used to those words. I try to punch them a little bit because they're huge. In Jesus' time, it was a shame-based culture. If you ate with sinners, basically, you just became like them. And yet the Son of God, who stepped down from his throne, a king like no other, has come to be with us and to eat with sinners prostitutes, tax collectors, just those people who you know have been up to no good. And when we are being honest with ourselves, that means Jesus ate with us. And here's the beautiful thing, right? That table, remember we talk about this table once a month at least, <laughs> That table is not a United Methodist table. That is Christ's table. And Christ invites all who love him to the table. We are all invited wherever we are and what, whatever our circumstances, whatever happened last night, whatever happened, and truthfully knowing that something may happen tomorrow, we seek to go on to perfection, to be perfected in the love of Christ, but sometimes we don't quite get there. And yet, if we ask for forgiveness and God's help, God is continuing to pour love into us to help us. And like we talked about last week, when we talked about practicing hope and practicing peace, we must also then practice this joy and while joy is something deeper, it is not happiness. We, we will try to force ourselves to be happy during this time. Merry Christmas! <laughs> happy New Year! I noticed, I saw a picture where I was um, saying something where I was being... <clears throat> and I did notice that I smile almost the same way. Um, I'm not sure what that says. We, we do have to seek out that inner joy. Remember, joy is a fruit of the Spirit. And so when we pray, when we read Scripture, when we gather together and worship, when we serve in one way or another, we are inviting the Holy Spirit in to help us be a people overflowing with the fruit of joy. But it does take practice. And so, just because of how the timing of the music worked out, y'all got to stand up and sit down a lot for the first part of the service. And but joy to the world. It came upon a midnight clear. Hark the herald angels sing. We're going to go out to go tell it on a mountain. And we will practice joy. We are fortunate. We are not right now, probably 
I could be wrong. Maybe someone within the sound of my voice right now is wondering about whether or not they're going to be with someone by the end of the week. But most of us are not in the midst of that kind of uncertainty. And yet, here was Mary having a child in a very strange way with people saying stuff because you know they were. Greeted with joy and responding with joy. And so we are called, even in the midst of our busyness, our ups and downs, to practice joy. And here's the thing. I worry that sometimes when we talk about these things, it feels like it's just another thing to add to your list. All right. So you're supposed to be hopeful and peaceful and now joyful. Get it together. Come on. And here's the thing, though. What if, what if that's not where you are? Okay. If you're not, okay. If you are, watch for the people who maybe aren't in a place of joy and just be near them. They may not want a hug. Be near them. Kindness also is a fruit. Patience is also a fruit. One way or another, we can be about joy. Let's do that for one another. Elizabeth greeted Mary with joy. And don't you think Mary needed that desperately? So let's... uh, Let's keep about the joy when we can. And if we're desperate for it, you are loved. You are gorgeous in God's sight. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. And all God's people said, Amen. And now... Let us continue in our time together as we share our joys and concerns. And Miss Laura, how is little Zachary doing? So Zachary would have been tearing up this center aisle, bringing up Chrismans. So Leanne and I wound up having to do Zachary duty today because as some of you saw in the email, he tested positive for COVID. So our little guy has has been doing okay. He's been doing pretty well, but we've been holding him in prayer and it's good to hear that um, everybody's negative now, but there is another round of this happening. And so that is a good thing that we can share as we lifted him in prayer, we can share that he's doing okay. Please let him know that we missed him So what are the other people? Who are the people that we would lift up in prayer? What are the situations that we would lift up? Oops. Yes, ma'am. So um, as many of us know, Jerry has been having, Kelly, I got most of that, so let's make sure I got it right. Um, Jerry has been having some health issues, as you know, and, um, and Pat and Jerry would like to be able to go visit family next week. 
And so we are continue to keep Jerry in prayer and Pat in prayer during these days and in this time, but especially we're lifting up that they can be able to visit family as they are hoping to. For Ted and Liz? No. Jennifer and Liz. Okay. We're keeping Jennifer and Liz in prayer. And Pat and Jerry. And we are excited that we see Tula back in the back. Yes, because we've been keeping her in prayer. Yes. And um, it's good to see those of you who are with us during this time because um, as the cold weather comes, even if it's a little cool here, it's getting really cold up north. And we know some of our friends have gotten back to us or will be traveling, so we're thankful for safe travels and continued safe travels as people are uh, running the roads and the skies as we do those visits. And so let us go to the Lord in prayer. Dear God, we thank you for all the ways that you love us and for the beauty of this time of year and the wonder and joy that often fills our hearts. And we thank you for your son, Jesus. The reason, yes, for the season and really the reason for all of it. Everything, dear God. You are every breath that we take. And your spirit moves within us. And through your son, Jesus Christ, you are with us, our God, Emmanuel. And we are given the opportunity for new life. For a resurrected life that leaves behind the old. It doesn't just leave it where it's there. It's gone. Dear God, the old passes away and the new comes. That's what's possible in you through Christ. And we thank you for that. And we ask, dear God, for your continued empowering, empowering by your Holy Spirit, and that as your Spirit is poured out on us and those whom we have lifted up, and those whom we have thought about but not said out loud, the whispers and cries of our hearts, all we lift up, all your children everywhere, so that in healing and mercy and grace, they will feel your presence and be made whole. And where there, where there is chaos, we would have peace. And when, where there is chaos, where we can be a peacemaker, show us, dear God. And when, where there is loneliness and darkness, show us how we might be light and joy. If all it means is smiling into someone's eyes, or holding a hand, or just sitting quietly, whatever it is, help us. We would be about your beautiful, gorgeous work in this world. You are the power. We are just an excited part of what you do. Use us, empower us, and we say all of this, we ask all of this with confidence because you said that we can, and in your love for us, you came to be with us, and through your Son, you taught us how to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Okay, who's got the microphone? <laughs> We came so close to getting the mic everywhere it was supposed to go. Thank you. The cross. 1 Peter 2.24 tells us that Jesus himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. The cross is one of the oldest symbols of Christianity. There are many forms of the cross. These are just a few. The Tau cross, made from the Greek letter T, is the simplest of all crosses. It is often used as the cross of prophecy or Old Testament cross, meaning that salvation is promised but not accomplished and is a symbol for Advent. The Latin cross is the most common of all cruciforms, and it reminds us of the supreme sacrifice offered by Jesus for the sins of the world. The cross is empty to remind us of the resurrection and the hope of eternal life. The Greek cross is an ancient cruciform with four arms of equal length that remind us of the four Gospels. The Celtic cross dates back to the Celtic Christians in Ireland in the 7th century. The circle which surrounds the arms reminds us of the eternal nature and love of God. Please stand as you are able and join in the first verse of O Come All Ye Faithful. The butterfly. The butterfly is a symbol of the resurrection. The beautiful butterfly rising from the seemingly lifeless chrysalis of the ugly caterpillar reminded the early Christians of the new life that is ours in Christ. Three circles. This figure formed of three interwoven circles is a symbol for the Trinity. The circles represent the internal nature of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Entwined, they remind us that God is one, even though God is revealed in three persons. So our final praise anthem this morning, it's all the message this morning has all been about the message itself, the message of joy and the messengers who brought that, the angels going all over the place to share that good news, the message that we continue to see and hear even today, that the message is still out there. Do not be afraid. I bring you tidings of great joy. And so today for our final praise anthem, we're going to be singing about those very same angels with angels we have heard on high. Please stand as you are able. Hey. 
Christ whose birth the angels sing. Come adore on bended knee, Christ the Lord, the newborn King. See Him in the manger laid, whom the choirs of angels praise. Mary, Joseph, lend your aid, while our hearts in love we raise. Heaven's heart not break on the day, the day that you came. Salvation's reason to celebrate on the day, the day that you came. And how could heaven's heart? The day, the day that you came, salvation's reason to celebrate on the day. God's people said, Amen. Amen. And let us join together in our congregational prayer for the end of the service. Holy God, we come with anticipation as we prepare to celebrate the birth of your Son, who rescued us from the darkness of sin by making the cross a tree of life and light. May this tree arrayed in splendor remind us of the life-giving cross of christ that we may always rejoice in the new life that shines in our hearts we ask this through jesus our, our lord amen hear these words of benediction This light, this light is a symbol, as those are all symbols. You are more than a symbol. You are the light of the world, because Christ has called you that. Hear these words of benediction. Go now in peace, in the love of God, the grace of Christ, and the strength of the Holy Spirit. Go out in joy, in peace, and with hope, and be light. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.